There are lots of folks out there in World Wide Web land who do not understand what a bubble is. And of course, I am referring to a bubble as it pertains to money and economics. Not a Lawrence Welk type of bubble. Yes. There is much prattle these days about credit bubbles, and housing bubbles, and bursting bubbles, and dot-com bubbles. But there does appear to be a lack of clarity vis-a-vis -vis this concept. We are cartoon characters. Did you just say, vis-a-vis? -vis? Isn't it a bit on the highbrow side for cartoon characters to say, vis-a-vis? -vis? No. It is fine. We are the intellectuals of the cartoon world. Oh. Okay. I was worried. Anyway, back to bubbles. At its most basic level, a bubble exists when too many people have access to easy money. Too many people are able to secure loans and credit, and financing and speculative investment without having to provide an honest, real picture as to how they will be able to repay these loans. In fact, bubbles are primarily caused when loans and credit are extended into an environment in which no one is really thinking about, or worrying about, repayment. This is the basic foundation of all economic bubbles. That's it? That's the whole deal? Of course not. There are myriad other factors that play a part in the blowing of asset and other economic bubbles. But the one unifying dynamic of all economic bubbles is that too much speculation, which takes the form of exponential increases in leveraged investment and ill-advised credit extension, chases a limited amount of actual stuff. Stuff? Okay, stuff is admittedly not the best word choice. But here is an example. In 1866, just as the United States was emerging from four horrible years of war, the government and the banks conspired to make easy money available to investors and speculators in the incipient booming railroad industry. In 1873, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 railroads operating in the United States. Of course, only a handful of these railroads could really end up being profitable. I mean, there are only so many train passengers, and only so many goods, to be shipped from one place to another. What is your point? My point is that dozens of railroads went bankrupt in 1873, because all of the debts that had been incurred due to the extension of easy money and credit came due. Thus followed the panic of 1873. It was a terrible economic depression. So what? We live under a fiat currency regime now. We can create all of the money that we need, in order to service all of those debts. Our political and economic leaders would like you to think so. They are betting the metaphorical farm on the belief that we can grow the economy at 5% per year, forever. And their wager is based entirely upon the premise that the extension of credit and the existence of easy money is a bottomless well. And you do not believe it is? Of course not. The primary function of debt is that profit is made on repayment of principal and interest. If enough people default on their obligations, the credit machine stops working. But the Federal Reserve and the Ben Burning can create money at will. There will always be liquidity, and thus there will always be credit. No. Because if the Ben Bernank goes too far with his loose monetary policies, the dollar no longer holds its place as the world's most valuable and trusted currency. When trust in the dollar evaporates, the low interest rate, easy money regime comes to an end. No one remains as a purchaser of our debt, other than the Fed itself. At that point, the currency, by definition, collapses. It is no longer viewed as a medium of exchange. It is monopoly money. Nothing more. Really? Of course. If you keep loaning me money, and if I keep promising to repay those monies, but I never do, in fact, repay my debts, eventually my IOUs are junk. And even if I can endlessly print money to repay you, at some point you come to the conclusion that the gravy train is not based upon the value of underlying stuff. The credit and debt no longer hold sufficient value, because the debtor has nothing left, other than the digitized printing presses and the promises of the government whose lies have finally coagged up with it. Interesting. And a little scary. Yes. The housing bubble was bad enough. Tens of trillions of dollars in easy credit money, which no one who was thinking clearly could have ever believed, would actually be repaid, was created by banks without a moment's reflection on what might happen when the credit bubble reached its peak. And now we know. Yes, we do. But it is too late. Correcting the problem, which means refusing to inflate any more bubbles based upon low interest rate regimes and loose monetary policies, would lead to a severe correction. There would be a massive contraction in the economy, 
but it sounds like your contention is that this will happen anyway. Yes. Eventually the system will seize up, because there will simply be no one left either to loan money to, or who will be willing to purchase our increasingly worthless debt. Eventually the entire money as debt bubble deflates. And when that happens, make sure you have somewhere to hide. It's gonna get ugly. Yes. It is.